So I want to begin, if we could move to the next slide, please. And I want to start my remarks with a brief reminder of our path to reopen Philadelphia's public schools. Planning for the start of school amidst changing circumstances is challenging, and we approach this work thoughtfully, collaboratively, with public health experts from the Children's Hospital, as was previously indicated, and the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, and with an enormous sense of responsibility. As we made and continue to make decisions about reopening, we have always had three lenses through which we are approaching our work and our planning the health and safety of all of our school community members and employees, the academic and social and emotional well-being of our students, many of whom would benefit greatly from face-to-face -face instruction, and the needs of families and stakeholders, including needed childcare. I want to thank everyone who has been and continues to be involved in this effort, and it has been all-consuming, and I know how hard everyone has worked in the interests of students and families. And, and one of the things that I think is really important is I, that it means we must be nimble considering the, the ever-changing guidance that we're receiving and our ability to plan for and adapt to changing circumstances. We're committed to doing just that. And, the, and I also acknowledge that all of this collective work has taken place in a future that is highly uncertain. And so that's why it's really important for us to, to remain as nimble as, as possible. Next slide, please. As a reminder, since May, we have had seven working groups exploring a range of areas that are vital for a safe and successful school year. The groups collaborated with state and city officials from the Pennsylvania Department of Education and the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, as well as with our principals, teachers, and union partners. We received survey responses from over 36,000 students, family members, school-based staff members, and school community members who supported returning to a hybrid learning model with in-person learning in September. And we considered input that was received during virtual town halls, Facebook Live events, and through advisory boards. Based on all of this, we produced an adaptive plan that keeps the safety and shared interests of our whole community in mind. Last Thursday, we received feedback from over 100 registered speakers, many of whom were educators and families concerned about our ability to move to a hybrid learning model that includes two days of in-person instruction. Next slide, please. As we transition, as, as we look at the, this, the upcoming school year, I think one thing that's really important is that we consider all of what we heard uh, from last Thursday. And we have evolved our plan as a result of that. Um, and, as, and now our plan will begin with all young people starting in a virtual uh, model and that model will then go through the end of the first grading period, which is November 17th. There's nothing magical about the, the date, November 17th. It's just the end of the first grading period because we wanted to mark a period in time by which we were actually working towards trying to get children back into some face-to-face -face, uh, learning. So looking more at a phased in approach and starting virtually, but then moving to a hybrid model. And as we transition to the hybrid model, we'll prioritize students with complex needs and their youngest learners. As research suggests, they benefit most from face-to-face -face instruction. We will then phase in other student populations and grades so they can also benefit from face-to-face -face instruction and in-person support from teachers, counselors, and other school-based staff. Based on this approach, we will not be moving forward with the Digital Academy as previously proposed. For the hybrid model, we will continue to evaluate options for families who wish to continue with a fully digital model that prioritizes students being taught by teachers in their enrolled school. Like districts across the country, adaptability is critical, 
as we approach this school year so that we can move along the continuum of digital and face-to-face -face learning when necessary in response to changing transmission rates and emergent public health guidance and best practices. I think it's also important to point out here that district operated pre-K and district buildings will also operate remotely through at least the first marking period. Chromebooks are being purchased for students enrolled in district operated pre-K programs and will be distributed to our pre-K families as soon as they are available so that preschoolers can also receive daily digital instruction until the school buildings reopen for face-to-face -face instruction. By implementing a daily schedule that provides opportunities for hands-on independent activity as well as teacher facilitated, digital, teacher facilitated digital instruction at the whole group, small group, and individual levels, we will not require we will not require or expect any child to spend more than 90 minutes on screen time on any given day. These are pre-K uh, children. Parents who want their preschool children to receive face-to-face -face instruction during the time will be referred to one of the district partner pre-K providers for service. You can get more information about pre-K options and register online for one of the more than 200 locations uh, for the 2020-2021 school year by visiting philasd.org slash pre-k. Can we move to the next slide, please? To, to be successful this year, it's critical that our students have the devices and internet access needed to fully participate digitally, whether in a full, fully digital model or in a hybrid model. Chromebooks will be provided to any student who needs one for digital learning. In preparation for the start of the school year, we have purchased 50,000 Chromebooks in addition to the 80,000 Chromebooks that were distributed to students in the spring. This includes 10,000 Chromebooks for district pre-K students. If students need a device for digital learning, they will get one. We're working on options to make additional Chromebook additional Chromebooks available and we want to make sure that they can be distributed as conveniently as possible for students and families. And we will share that information as soon as it's available. We're also coordinating with city leaders who are working with numerous local internet companies to provide reliable internet access to all Philadelphia students who need it for the start of the school year and throughout the year. To support these efforts, all student households are being contacted by both email and a direct phone call to determine if they have access to reliable internet and a Chromebook. It's critical that our teachers and school-based staff also have access to the devices they need to support students digitally. All principals, assistant principals, teachers, and counselors have laptops, and school secretaries will be receiving laptops in the coming weeks. We're also working to ensure that key school-based staff who have been identified as needing a device will also receive one. Next slide, please. As always, student achievement is at the forefront of the district's priorities. In this digital learning environment, students will receive a full day of instruction from teachers in their enrolled school who will work both to address learning loss from the spring and to support students' social and emotional needs. We will launch the Healing Together initiative digitally, which is designed to address the mental health and social emotional needs of our students, staff, and families in trauma-informed ways. This includes teachers hosting a daily morning meeting to build community, set and reinforce expectations in the digital environment, and practice social and emotional skills. As we design the daily experience of students, our goal is to create an environment that enables both independent and group work and allows flexibility in timelines and assessments. Five days a week, students will participate in both synchronous instruction, synchronous instruction or instruction in which the teacher and students are actively engaging with each other and asynchronous instruction in which students complete independent, independent tasks. Daily synchronous instruction will include whole class direct instruction, 
small group instruction, and small group collaboration. Doing synchronous instruction, teachers will continually observe and monitor student learning by checking for understanding, scaffolding learning, and providing feedback. Teachers will add opportunities for individualized instruction as needed to assess each student's proficiency. We learned in the spring that the teacher-led instruction and availability is critical for success as it leads to high levels of student engagement. In order to maximize this instructional time with the teacher, students will apply learn skills and practice independently doing asynchronous instruction. Teachers will be equipped with resources necessary to make the instructional design a reality in each of their digital classrooms. The Office of Academic Supports will provide teachers with the following resources, which will be adapted to the virtual environment. <clears throat> English language arts and mathematic frameworks, which will outline the philosophy for teaching of subjects and expectations for curriculum implementation. Year at a glance and quarter at a, at a glance documents for each subject that include scope and sequence, content detailing topics to be taught each day, and fully developed daily lessons for the first four weeks of school. And finally, professional learning sessions on the development and planning of lessons aligned to the foundational expectations for instruction. We'll be providing students with resources as well and are developing a plan for safe and efficient pickup of materials similar to our Chromebook and meal distribution sites. In addition to Chromebooks for all students who have not yet received them, these resources will include core texts and workbooks for English language arts and math, printed copies of lessons for those who prefer them, and additional paper materials for students with disabilities and English learners. It is critical that we maintain a particular focus on our students with unique needs. Additional resources will be available for, for these students and their teachers. Specialized schedules will be developed for students with varying disabilities. Students who need support engaging with technology will receive assistive devices. Teachers who work with students with disabilities and English learners will receive specialized professional learning sessions and guidance documents. And paraprofessionals who support these students will be given additional access to technology and professional learning. We're also, we are also exploring the possibility of providing related services to students with disabilities at distribution centers for meals and materials. For students experiencing homelessness, we will continue to distribute hotspots and backpacks with supplies. We're also committed to engaging students in athletics and extracurricular interests whenever and however possible. The Office of Athletics Return to Play Plan which I discussed at length last week will be implemented with guidance from the CDC and the Philadelphia Department of Public Health and in collaboration with the city once Philadelphia reaches the green phase of reopening. Some athletic components will occur digitally in the meantime, including coaching, mentoring, and organizing of NCAA meetings. Schools will also continue to remotely offer and host extracurricular activities that are possible in a digital setting. Next slide, please. This slide presents, I wanted to pause here and, and use the next two slides to highlight what our instructional approach may look like and feel like in a full day of instruction for students. So let's walk through the digital day of a fictitious fourth grade student um, uh, for the purpose of tonight's presentation, we've named uh, this student Michaela from Hartramp Elementary School. And it's just a made up, it's not a made up school, but it is a made up fourth grader. Um, to start the digital day, Michaela gets her materials ready for the school day, opens her Chromebook, and logs on to the online learning platform. She starts her day with a morning meeting where she greets her classmates and completes a team building activity. Michaela's first academic class is reading, and during the instructional block, she participates in whole group instruction, small group, instru small group reading, and independent writing. At the end of the block, she submits a draft writing assignment that the teacher will provide feedback on tomorrow. She takes a five minute break and then joins art class. Michaela logs off and eats lunch with her sister. Her family picked up 
the meals from the district earlier in the week. After lunch, Michaela works with her teacher in a small group. The next day, Michaela is aware she'll be working independently to practice what she's learning today. Michaela's last class is science. She observes a short virtual experiment and engages with the teacher and class to develop a hypothesis and write a science report. Michaela then logs off and completes her independent reading. She does her homework and gets ready for the next digital day of school. Next slide, please. So just as we wanted to show what a day in the digital life of a elementary student would look like, we also wanted to show a day for a high school student. And just like Michaela, we're gonna use Chris, who's also a fictitious ninth grader at not a made up school, but at Northeast High School. Chris starts his day, checking to make sure his Chromebook is charged. He logs into the learning platform and reads the announcements for the day. He then logs into his morning meeting. Next, Chris goes to his synchronous algebra class. The teacher reviews open-ended problems the students solved yesterday independently. In history class, Chris participates in a synchronous seminar debating an amendment. At the end of the class, students are assigned positions for a persuasive essay they will write throughout the week. Chris's English class is a focused discussion on short story students, on short story students read for homework. From there, he logs into a virtual session with his advisor, which starts with a rapid whip around of one positive thing each student did yesterday. After class, he has a five minute break. For physical education, Chris and his class participate in a virtual Zumba class. After class, he logs off his computer and has lunch. The afternoon starts off with a small group lesson with his algebra teacher. He's able to get clarity around the problems he and his fellow students struggle with doing earlier in the morning. After the small group, Chris opens up his history classroom to read some of the primary sources and outline his argument for the persuasive essay. Chris logs off to take a break, but plans to log on later in the evening to prepare for tomorrow. Next slide, please. Of course, our principals, teachers, and school-based staff are critical to ensuring that our students can succeed in this digital environment and receive in-person support safely. While we are currently 99.4% staff for teacher roles, we are continuing to hire additional staff in anticipation of potential needs based on teachers who may not be able to report to the building due to medical issues. We're also continuing to hire cleaning staff to ensure we have appropriate numbers to support the safe return to staff, the safe return of staff to buildings. It's important to note that food service, cleaning, maintenance, transportation, and some central office staff have been working on site consistently or have returned in the yellow and green phases. Our goal is to have all staff on site prior to the return of students to physical buildings to provide critical service to our students and to our families. But while we, while we remain in a digital model, some staff's roles and expectations will be different, and we're working with our union partners to discuss potential changes. Next slide, please. And I think it's also important to understand that we cannot successfully plan any large scale change in isolation or without input from our stakeholders, including sincere engagement with their union partners. Since buildings close, and I think this is really important, especially based on some of the testimony we heard last week, that since buildings close on March 13th, Chief Talent Officer has held a standing meeting with leaders from all five unions and sometimes additional members of the district's leadership team. We created this structure to ensure consistency of communication amidst, amidst ever-changing circumstances and public health guidance. This group has met 21 times since March 13th. In addition to these standing meetings, the district has held ad hoc meetings with each union on reopening issues specific to their bargaining unit. At least 25 of these meetings have been held between May and last week's action meeting. For example, in May and June, we held three calls with the PFT and CASA, 
and at least three meetings with 32BJ to discuss drafts and potential updates to cleaning and ventilation protocols. Draft protocols were sent to these unions on June 10th and an updated version on July 8th before being finalized on July 15th. And the Office of Facilities hosts a standing weekly meeting with 32BJ. In addition, reopening work group leads have extended opportunities for all union leadership to engage with them in multiple ways. For example, all unions, all union leads were invited to a reopening planning kickoff meeting on April 29th. All reopening work groups, work group leads met with all union leads on July 1st and July 9th to share the structure and protocols that were going to be proposed in the July 15th plan. We shared a high level outline of the plan with unions on July 8th and the full draft language of the plan on July 13th. Today, we're committed to doing more. We ask that our school leaders and staff continue to collaborate and problem solve with us and that they remain flexible with us in this ever-changing environment. We continue to want your input on potential solutions, not just once plans are finalized and published, but before we even start writing them. We're sharing draft documents in early stages with union leadership to solicit input on rough ideas. And since last week's action meeting, a chief academic officer, a chief talent officer, a chief of schools have met with the PFT four times to discuss new issues that will need to be addressed with the shift to an all digital start of school. They will meet again tomorrow. We know there are many questions that still need answers and we heard many from many of the teachers who were on the town hall, the virtual town hall earlier today. And we know that full consensus is not always possible, but we still strive for it. And we will continue to listen to feedback and adjust plans in response. Next slide, please. I'd like, to, I'd like to turn now to training and professional development and how we will work in collaboration with principals, teachers, and school-based staff to prepare to teach and support students digitally, both as we start the year in a fully digital model and as we progress to a hybrid model. This year, teachers will have more professional learning needs and we have little time to meet them. So professional learning needs to be relevant so professional learning needs to be relevant, focused, succinct, and scaffolded. Professional learning sessions will be held virtually to maintain the appropriate distancing and reduce barriers to participation, thus allowing us to reach a larger audience and support more employees. In August, school-based staff will engage in professional learning that focuses on the use of digital resources. We learned in the spring that this training is critical to ensuring our staff are prepared to teach digitally. These trainings will focus on using Zoom and Google Suite, at Google Meet, Classroom, Docs, and Drive. In, order, in other words, the whole Google Suite. Implement, implementing instructional expectations in a 100% digital environment, supporting the social and emotional development of students, and implementing trauma-informed virtual practices. After the start of school, we will continue to offer existing district-wide professional learning adapted to our evolving circumstances. In addition to the district-wide PD days, 30 to 60 minute sessions will be created, tailored to the time of the year and focused on data-based strategies. To be successful this year, we need to celebrate the innovative practices happening in our schools and foster a sense of shared responsibility to support one another. We will create a system to gather strong examples of teachers and counselors supporting students in a digital environment that are representative of all schools, grades, and content areas and share them with staff. We're also developing training to prepare our students and families for digital learning. This year we will be challenging, this year will be challenging for our students, our families, uh, our, our guardians and staff and we are all need to be prepared to learn alongside each other. Next slide, please. In addition to preparing our workforce, we continue to prepare our buildings to be safe and healthy learning environments. 
This includes implementing health and safety protocols for deep cleaning and disinfecting in all school buildings, training staff on hot touch cleaning areas and use of electrostatic backpack sprayers and repairing and replacing sinks and soap and towel dispensers. We know ventilation is a significant concern for both families and staff. The information we learned about transmission of this virus and the impact of ventilation continues to evolve and we are diligently following all recommendations from the Philadelphia Department of Public Health and other public health experts. Following recommendations from the CDC and the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, we are increasing the circulation of outdoor air as much as possible in our buildings by adjusting existing HVAC systems and fixing windows and adding window fans in buildings without HVAC systems. All of our buildings were assessed using a ventilation checklist approved by the American Federation of Teachers, Environmental Protection Agency, the CDC, and other experts. This assessment identified 22 schools with acute ventilation concerns in either the entire building or certain classrooms related to limited windows or systems or system function issues. We're working to increase air circulation in these buildings using the strategies described. If we are unable to address these issues, the room or space will be taken offline. In order to certify buildings as ready to occupy, we have also contracted with a certified air balancer who will determine how many occupants are permitted in each room based on the availability of fresh air. In addition to acting on recent public health guidance, we continue to address environmental issues and make capital improvements. Since March, 61 capital projects have been underway, including boiler replacements, roof replacements, improvements to CTE classrooms, and 147 classroom modernizations. By August 15th, we will have completed paint and plaster stabilization projects across 24 schools and removed 192,000 square feet of asbestos containing material and 60,000 linear feet of asbestos containing pipe insulation since shutting down in the spring. And by starting the year fully digitally, we will be able to take on around 45 additional projects that were planned for later in the year to ensure that more buildings are fully operational before staff and students return. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Tonight, what we're asking the board to consider are five action items that will support the plan we've outlined to start the school year with all students learning digitally. The first action item that I'll highlight here is the proposed changes to the 2020-2021 academic calendar. Under the proposed plan, Wednesday, September 2nd will be the first day of school for students instead of August 31st. This extra time before students start school allows us to support teachers with more professional development, which will begin on August 24th. This next slide, please. <clears throat> the second action item that I'll highlight is the district's health and safety plan, which is required by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. The PDE health and safety plan is a technical document that includes detailed safety plans and protocols across the state's broader color-coded reopening phases, as well as necessary resources, materials, and professional development. PDE provided the template for all school districts in the Commonwealth to complete and required that the plan be tailored to each district's unique needs. All districts approved plans are posted on the district's website and on PDE's website. This plan has been updated to reflect starting the year with all students learning digital. The third action item is the district's return to play plan, which I mentioned earlier in this presentation. As I noted, the return to play plan will be implemented with guidance from the CDC and the Philadelphia Department of Public Health and in collaboration with the city once Philadelphia reaches the green phase of reopening. The fourth action item is the Healing Together initiative, which I also mentioned earlier in this presentation. All components of Healing Together will be delivered and supported virtually, and all will incorporate an explicit emphasis on equity and anti-racism. The fifth and final action item I want to highlight authorizes a memorandum of understanding with the Behavior Health 
providers selected to provide services in each of our schools. Uh, that's right, this year for the first time, there will be a behavior health provider assigned to every school in our district. This will increase access to mental health services for students and families, and the services provided will complement, not replace, existing services. We are working to ensure that these services are accessible this fall in a virtual environment. This intensive behavior health services initiative, or IBHS, represents more than five years of planning and collaboration with city agencies, with principals, students, and families. I wanna thank Mayor Kenny and the leadership at DBH and CBH and Health and Human Services uh, for their support. Next slide, please. Lastly, I want to share our digital learning implementation pathway. As we shift to starting the school year with all students learning digitally, we need to also shift our critical implementation steps to both prepare to be fully digital and ensure that we can progress to a hybrid learning model. Here's a view of what the adjusted implementation pathway includes. Some of the steps along the way, along the pathway, enable the start of the digital school model. Some enable phasing into hybrid learning and some represent decision points that may require revisions to the reopening plan. These decision points are indicated with the red dots. As we prepare to start the school year digitally and plan to phase into a hybrid model, a critical ongoing activity is to identify students who need devices and reliable internet. As I previously noted, we are proactively and dil diligently reaching out to student households by both email and phone to determine if they have access to reliable internet and a Chromebook. This work will continue to ensure students have the tools necessary to be successful in a digital learning environment. As we receive this information, we are sharing it with city leaders who are working with local internet companies to provide reliable internet access to all Philadelphia students who need it. The next critical step on the implementation pathway was completed last week with the creation of a digital instructional design that I discussed on a previous slide. The next immediate step in our implementation pathway is the board's approval of the district's health and safety plan as required by PDE. As already noted, this plan has been updated to reflect starting the year with all students learning digitally. Schools are currently developing operational plans in line with the district's guidance that best fit their school and meet the needs of their students. These plans include information that is relevant for digital learning, like student schedules, teacher assignments, as well as operations that support hybrid learning, such as transportation, meals, classroom usage, and more. Each school will submit their operation plan for approval in the next step shown here. The district will then lay out an approach for staffing coverage and filling open roles. Staffing levels are critical to moving toward a hybrid learning and inadequate staffing will impact phasing as well as the timeline. Following our staffing plans, we will ready our facilities and school buildings and procure health and safety supplies, including face coverings, necessary cleaning materials, and signage. As we move into the third week of August, we will complete a full readiness check to ensure that we are prepared to start the school year with all students learning digitally. This will be followed by staff professional development, which will take place a week and a half before students return and include training on digital platforms and resources as well as instructional design. As already noted, the district is proposing that September 2nd be the first digital day for students. Our last step shown here will continue throughout the school year as we monitor public health guidance, prepare to return staff to buildings prior to students, and phasing into hybrid learning and track student engagement and academic outcomes. To support all of these efforts, we are creating a readiness report to help track progress along our implementation pathway, including additional readiness checks in advance of staff returning to buildings and phasing in hybrid learning. The readiness report is being updated to reflect starting with a digital model and will be available for the August action meeting and in preparation for the start of the school year. I'd like to reiterate two things. First, 
Starting the school year with all students learning digitally does not mean we are decreasing our emphasis on student achievement and student learning. Instructional rigor, quality teaching, and academic supports remain crucial components of the 2020-2021 school year, regardless of the method in which students are attending school. Second, we will continue to remain flexible through the start of the school year as we prepare for hybrid learning and will continually adapt our approach to meet public health guidance and the needs of our stakeholders. Um, and with that, President Wilkerson, uh, I conclude my remarks.